welcome to Fire Engineering Radio and to our show, Pride and Ownership, the Love for the Job. I'm your host, Chief Rick Lasky, and uh, a couple quickies here, like we always do at the beginning of the show. Um, uh, just a reminder that our, our the Firefighter Basics book, if you listen to uh, the last two shows, we had Professor Glenn Corbin on and talked about what I feel is going to be one of the most incredible training tools or instruments to hit the fire service in years is going to be this book that 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 Penwell's put out, Fire Engineering's put put out the, the whole curriculum, everything that comes with it, uh, from the embedded videos to the powerpoints to everything is just awesome. So look for that hopefully in September, um, throughout September. Um, just had the opportunity to, to again, and and we we talk about all the great trips we make all over the country visiting with folks, but was in Bonita Springs, Florida. Uh, you know, just uh, what, what a what a what a great group of people with a great fire department, but uh, Chief John Salka, my, my teacher partner, and I were down there to do a leadership program, and uh, they had made a good grab. I want to talk about just for one second here. They, they made a great grab. Actually, Mark Simon, who's the son of a deputy chief I used to work right next door to in Lyle Woodard, Jim Simon, uh, up in Illinois. Uh, Mark was the acting officer, had an acting driver and a firefighter's first fire, and knew they had a rescue. Uh, dispatch had the, the, the lady on the phone. She was down uh, the police department pulled up, sheriff's office pulled up, uh, the bedroom had already flashed, they had a lot of smoke, a lot of fire, and if you were to listen to the phone conversation and hear them, you know, force the door, yelling for her, finding her, calling for EMS, it, by the way, she's going to make a full recovery, um, and it lit up as they were dragging her out, lit up, uh, even damaged some of their turnout gear, um, a lot of fire, and they turned around and, and went back in after handing her off the EMS and, and put out the fire with the rest of their team from from uh, Bonita, um, listen to the radio traffic. What a great job! This is this is the kind of stuff that the the, the leadership within the organization, the leadership within well Mark's ability to act up as the officer for that day and do what he did, their tactics and strategy. It, it, they've got a great training division uh, with, with a great training lieutenant, and and it's all paying off. It all paid off right there. And the lady's alive. The guys are okay, and it's just it's all good stuff. So. Uh, if, if you happen to run into anybody from Bonita Springs, hats off to them. Uh, great job down there by the men and women of that department. And lastly here, before we get to our, our, our guest, is I want to congratulate um, one of my brothers and another true brother of the fire service uh, on his retirement. Captain Jay Kuhn from the Sacramento, California Fire Department is retiring. Uh, we had Jay on the show actually um, a, a little while back um, uh, talking about the truck company officer and truck ops just from his Stamp, you know, uh, standpoint, and um, he had moved to the rescue. Jay's big in USAR, everything along those lines. If you've ever met Jay, you know what I'm about to say is true, and that is he is an incredible individual. He is a brother. He, is, I, I don't know, he's he's a great person. I'm just excited for him. I don't know how he's going to retire because he's always busy doing stuff. Um, but what a wonderful person. I love him to death. And, and Jay, uh, if you're listening, congratulations, pal. I'm proud of you, and I'm, I'm just honored to be your buddy. Today, I, I, I've been trying to pull this one off uh, for a while. There's a couple. It was it was uh, like like trying to get a couple of my mentors on the show before, just with busy schedules, and they're out teaching. And and uh, I've, I've I've got uh, one one of uh, the people I look up to and have for for many years, uh, Chief John Mittendorf, with us today. Let me give you a quick bio on Chief Mittendorf before we int uh, introduce him and welcome him on the show. Uh, Chief Mittendorf is a, is a 45-plus year veteran of the fire service. That's 45, if you didn't hear me. Um, serving 30 of those years at the Los Angeles City Fire Department, retiring at the rank of battalion chief, uh, following in his father's footsteps, and I'm going to ask him to talk about his dad in a little bit. Uh, he's been a member of the National Fire Protection Research Foundation on Engineered Lightweight Construction uh, Technical Advisory Committee, which if you've ever sat through any of his classes, that's just one tiny little portion of the incredible things he covers in his programs. Um, Chief Mittendorf has provided training programs for the National Fire Academy, UCLA. Um, the, the, the British Fire Academy in England has acted in an advisory capacity for five fire science advisory pro uh, boards on five colleges, five different colleges, and is the author of numerous fire ground articles for magazines in, in the United States and Europe. If you haven't read anything from Chief Mittendorf, you either started yesterday or you've been asleep in the corner of the firehouse somewhere for a long time. Uh, he's the author of the books Ventilation Methods and Techniques, Truck Company Operations, for which we have right here in our department, and Facing the Promotional Interview. He currently, le currently lectures in the United States and the United Kingdom on strategy and tactics, truck company operations, fire ground operations, ventilation operations, and the complete officer, among other topics. Chief Mittendorf is a member of the Editorial Advisory Board of Fire Engineering Magazine 
and received a Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, which if you look at the group that, that, that runs within that circle, it's, it's pretty incredible, pretty awesome, at FDIC in 2008. And it's my honor to, to welcome him to the show. Uh, Chief Mittendorf, welcome, brother. Well, thank you very much, Rick. It's a pleasure being here. Oh, uh, you, you know, I, I, and I, I, I mentioned your dad, and I, and you know where I'm going with this, because you and I, I've, I've, asked, I've actually this year at FDIC asked you to tell the story a couple times, uh, not just about your dad, uh, but but about how you got into the fire service and, and how that got going. And I, w- would you please share that with our listeners? You know, Rick, I'd really be happy to because I think it dovetails uh, in very, very nicely uh, with your book, uh, Pride of Ownership. In fact, when you came out with that book, which I think was long overdue, <clears throat> Um, uh, the first thing that struck me was when I when I looked at the book and, and I saw what you had to say. It kind of took me back to uh, to the desire and the uh, and, and the and, and what I wanted to do to be able to get on uh, the fire department. And I'll take you back to the beginning that uh, when I got out of uh, high school. Now I'm going to take the, the the listenership back a few years back about <laughs> 1958. You know, that's back when the uh, fire engine rolled out of the fire station and you were pulled by horses, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it you know, wasn't. What I, You're not. What can, uh, I, what can I say? So, <laughs> you know, one thing I do remember, Rick, is, is when I came on the job in 1963, <clears throat> we were just uh, transitioning from Burrell breathing apparatuses to the SCBA that we use today. Okay. And uh, it was really interesting, you know, as a, and, and I'm getting off on a tangent here, but... It's really interesting. As a rookie, you know, one of the first things you did when you came in the fire station was you had to check these burrells, which basically filtered smoke. And you checked this little disc on the front of the uh, the box to see if it was pink or blue or there was one other color. I don't know. <laughs> you know, and then uh, that's about when SCBA came. But anyway, <clears throat> so when I got out of uh, high school, I was going to uh, junior college, and you're trying to think about, well, you know, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? And I decided, well, I want to be an electrical engineer because I'd always been interested in electronics. And so I started going that way, and then I went to uh, Long Beach State University uh, for my degree in electrical engineering. Well, during that time, my dad was a captain on Los Angeles Fire Department. And while I was in, I'm just going to say the secular industry, I noticed that a lot of what we were doing was dependent on governmental contracts. And, you know, today was good, tomorrow wasn't quite as good, and so on. And, and I thought, well, you know, this is an up-and-down industry. And then I'm, I'm watching my dad, and he loved going to work, and uh, loved uh, uh, being with the guys. Every day was different, and, you know, he was home uh, today at work tomorrow, and then off again. And so he had a lot of time to do what he wanted to do, and I thought, you know... This doesn't look like too bad a deal to me. So <clears throat> one day I decided, this is 61, I thought, you know, I'm going to be a fireman. And so I talked to my dad, and he goes, he said, you know, that's something I'm not going to push into. He says, that's a decision you've got to make. Well, I'd already made the decision. <clears throat> so I went down and took all the exams. You know, you go through the interview and the written and the physical agility and all of that. And I smoked that stuff, and I came to the medical, and in 1961... To get on the Los Angeles Fire Department, you had to be five foot eight inches and not a sixteenth of an inch less. And when they measured me, I was, and, and you know, Rick, the only reason I'm going to tell this story is just so I can keep the facts straight so John Salka doesn't twist them around down the road. <laughs> Which, by the way, John loves you to death. John, yeah, I know. I, and Chief, I don't want to embarrass you, but... You know, he is my best friend of the whole world. There's been times we've 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 had coffee with you. We're just visiting at a conference or yeah. wherever we're at, and he's walked away. And says, "God, I love that guy." No, I love I love John. In <laughs> fact, I got to tell a quick story on John. I know I'm getting off on a tangent. This this is about. <clears throat> in fact, I know we'll talk about it down the road here um, in this program. But uh, I just finished up the the uh, second edition of the truck operations manual, and I debated a long time about putting in there that the reason I got into positive pressure ventilation was because Salka pointed me in that, in that direction. <laughs> but, I, but I didn't do it. So. <laughs> he doesn't know how close he came to being ultra-famous. But anyway, so, <clears throat> so at any rate, um, when they measured me, I was 5'8", and as I remember, I was either 5'7", or 5'3", of an inch. I mean, you're talking like one-eighth of an inch to... 
one quarter of an inch less. And the doctor looked at me and he said, you're not tall enough. Have a nice day. See you later. And they flunked me. Oh. And <clears throat> so I came home and, and uh, my dad said, uh, well, how'd it go? I said, well, it went good until I got the medical and I got flunked uh, because I wasn't tall enough. And he says, well, how short were you? And I said, uh, quarter inch. He goes, well, he said, um, let's do a little homework. So he lined up an appointment with a friend of his who happened to be a, a chiropractor. And, went and, saw, and by the way, for the people that are listening, this story is true because by the time I'm done with it, you're going to say nobody could make this up. <laughs> and uh, we went to this chiropractor, and, the, and my dad says, well, he's a quarter inch short. What can we do about that? And this uh, guy says, well, he said, that's no problem. He says, you're taller in the morning than you are in the evening. And so he says, lay down, you know, so they, you know, stretch this and that and snap. And, you know, and, and when he got done, I was an inch and a half taller. Awesome. <laughs> so he says, you know, if you can take another examination, you know, file a protest and then take another examination and have it first thing in the morning, he says, you will be over 5'8". Really? Yeah, okay. So we come home and I file a medical protest, which you can do, and you go down for a remeasure. And so my dad says, you know, he says, let's... Uh, Let's get aggressive on this. So he goes out and he gets a piece of uh, plywood, you know, four by eight. And at that time, he had a, uh, a, a ski boat. And on the front of boat trailers, you know, you have a winch on there. He unbolts the winch from the boat trailer and bolts it to the plywood at one end. And on the other end, he has a couple, like a couple of stirrups. And he says, here, lay down. So he locks my feet in these stirrups. And then he puts like a padded uh, uh, lambskin thing under my... Uh, under my uh, jaw and attaches it to the uh, this boat winch and cranks this baby up to his, there's a little bit of tension on me. He says, how's that? I said, well, that's okay. You know, I can, I can live with this. He, he says, well, he says, let's do it tonight and let's measure you tomorrow morning. So we do that. I get up the next morning. <clears throat> let's see, 5'8". I'm like 5'9 and a half or three quarters. <laughs> I'm almost two inches taller. We're going, awesome. So... We get the letter back in the mail that I'm, uh, uh, you know, scheduled for a remeasure at 8 o'clock in the morning at uh, uh, City Hall, downtown Los Angeles. And we lived about uh, 40 miles out of L.A. at that time. And so the night before, laid down the device. My dad cranks this thing up, you know, and I said, uh, take one more turn. <laughs> Give me another eighth inch. For you know. good measures. <laughs> yeah, for good measures. No pun intended. <laughs> so, okay, so he takes another turn on this baby, you know. And I, uh, you know, sleep that night. The next morning, he takes this device, puts it in the back of his pickup truck, and of course you got to have the tailgate down. And I lay in it. He takes the turns on the on the boat winch again, cranks that. I tell him, you know, take another turn. He takes another turn, and we drive downtown L.A. down the freeway. And. Uh, What's interesting is he told me later on, he said, you ought to have seen the looks from the people that were driving by us. On I was going to say, people had to be like, you know, if it was nowadays with cell phones, they'd be calling it in on the, on, on the news yeah. show. Yeah, California Highway Patrol would be pulling you over like, <laughs> what on earth is going on here? Is that a mannequin back there? Is that a real person? <laughs> so at any rate, we drive all the way down, downtown L.A. He pulls right up in front of uh, uh, City Hall. And comes around, you know, loosens up the device. Out I hop, and I gingerly walk up the stairs, walk in. And they had a special device there that it looks like the, uh, you know, when you uh, go to the doctor's office and you stand on the scales. And the, remember, they used to lower a metal thing down to the top of your head to get, yeah. the, get your height. It was like that, but it had two buttons on the bottom. So both of your feet had to be on the buttons. In other words, you couldn't raise up, you know, and, and get an eighth inch you know, cheating a little bit, you had to have both feet on these buttons, and when they brought that metal thing down, man, they whapped it on the top of your head. <laughs> the guy goes, hey, you're 5'9". You're passed. Oh. Now I'm an L.A. City fireman. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, we talk about your book, you know, pride of ownership, the desire, the ability to really want to reach a goal. Uh, that was the picture that came to my mind. And, of course, when I go down for a medical today and they measure me, I'm 5'7", they go, man, you really shrunk. You know, said, <laughs> All those years of being a battalion chief. Yeah, you know, you know, what they... can I say? Well, you know, the outgrowth of that is is um, when I first made engineer 
driving the truck. My first shift, I opened up the door to the Seagrave, and uh, they had put two phone books on the seat. <laughs> they put uh, wood blocks on the on the clutch and on the brake. <laughs> oh God! That's something you well, carry with you for the rest of your life, you know. But you know, uh, Rick, uh, we have the best job in the world. And, but it, uh, but that that is the reason I asked you to, to explain that. I think I did to some of my guys at the fire engineering at the the bookstore there, and yeah. where the magazine group was. Just be, it's an incredible story. I mean, we've all got you know. You hear the stories nowadays, John. Where I, I took you know, I, I was a professional t- professional test taker. I took like five tests this month, and I went from weekend to weekend. Yeah. And and, and that being said, shows passion and desire. Yes. But oh my goodness, to, to you know that is just an incredible. You know what? If you want it bad enough. If you, you know, want it bad enough, you will go the extra mile, take the extra step. You know, a friend of mine uh, who we, we were fairly close on the department, his name was uh, Kramer, um, he was a little bit taller than I was. And so he tells the story. This is not as radical as mine. But before he went in to get measured, he went into the restroom, and, you know, they have the metal stalls around the heads, and, you know, they have a bar across the top. Uh-huh. He hung, you know, grabbed the top with his hands, and hung down, and he hung down as long as he could stand it before he went in and got measured. And they probably measured him at 5'8", and uh, probably 132nd of an inch. You know, he just uh, hung there for 15, 20 minutes as long as he could take it, and it was just enough just to get him that last, you know, eighth inch or whatever it was. Because, I mean, they were serious. If it was 5'8", it was 5'8", and it wasn't an eighth inch less. Well, and think of it, two things, Kerry, quickly. Think about... If you hadn't done that, and I've said this before and again, not to not to embarrass you, because you're entitled to to you know all the compliments that you've earned them. You've you've done so much for the fire service over the years, and I've said I, I've walked away. And when I when I bring this story up in class, and I say I never can do it justice, but think about what the fire service would have been without without John Mittendorf for us. I know you know for me it would it would have changed things, and and think about how many people because of a height restriction. You know, we we probably missed out on, on on the effects they had in the fire service. But you know, it's the passion you were just talking about that I guess it frustrates you. When I say if you want something bad enough, you'll do anything. When you have a candidate that can't complete the application, well, it doesn't fill it out. It doesn't provide you with the information. Right? To, isn't it? I mean, that's kind of a sign that says, you know, I'm not really serious about this. If you were serious, you would have filed on time. You would have turned the application packet in in full as as requested and. You know, those are the kind of guys like my, my buddy Chief Tom Freeman from from Lyle Woodward says. You know, you know, well, yeah, Chief, you wanted me to search the whole room, not not just behind the, the door. I mean, yeah, I wanted you to search the whole room. I wanted you to fill out the whole packet. So right. that that's passion. Where do you see? You know, we're going through some bad times. You and I were talking about it with Peter before we we even started today. Mm-hmm. You know, the economy. We're, we're just about everybody's going through some some bad. I was down in I guess in Bonita Springs, there's a department near them that's talking about laying off 30 guys. And I know people that have had to lay off firefighters. Uh, but, you know, we've been, you've been around. You've seen this, this happen years and years in the past. I mean, we're going to get through it. But what do you say to those young firefighters? If you walk into my firehouse today and you hear the guys, you know, maybe grumble a little bit or, you know, they're not necessarily here because they've been great about it. I'm being, I'm just picking on my right. department. And right. I would never, I've never walked into firehouse here and lately they're just grateful for what they're getting and they've been great about it. But yeah. somewhere there's a, there's a firehouse with some young firefighters that may not get it. You know what I'm saying? And, and, um, you know, may not, I just said, I think they're reading the newspaper. You walk into a firehouse and you hear the grumbling, you, you know, that it's just misplaced energy, but what do you say to them, John, as a, as a mentor, as a chief? You know, um, it's funny you bring that up, Rick, because I remember, you know, it's, it's interesting when you retire what you remember and what you tend to forget, <laughs> what you forget real quick. But a lot of the, a lot of the memories are, uh, are classic, and, and you're thankful for the opportunity to have been through it so that you can remember. You know, there's nothing, as an example, there's nothing like going to a fire and having everything go right, maybe you save somebody. You know, you were talking about the Bonita Springs uh, incident, you know. I mean, those guys go back to the fire station after they saved that person and maybe came within a half a second being caught in a flash over or whatever, and I'll bet you that the the buttons on the front of their shirts were just barely able to contain the pride that was oh. behind the other side of that shirt, you know. that the, I've always said that it's easy to be an officer in a busy fire station. It's tough being an officer in a slow fire station. Well, and, and, 
how how do you? We've talked about that yeah. before the show. How? Let's move. Let, Chief Mittendorf to the Slow Firehouse. Well, let, let me back up before oh, we go, go there, Rick, right. and, and go back because I didn't answer the question. I, as you know, I get off on tangents real easy, particularly uh, right before lunch. So, <laughs> um, you know, you, you know, what do you say to, to those firefighters? And and one of the things I remember is when my office was in the in a fire station, <clears throat> that I would walk into the fire station, and uh, and this was not. I'm going to say once in a while it was it was a little bit more than that but guys just have a tendency to take for granted what they have and uh, i mean that's just a human characteristic and i'd walk into the to the kitchen you know to you know get a bowl of ice cream or coffee or whatever and the, guy, and the guys are sitting there and this is a pretty good sized fire station so there might have been 10 or 15 guys sitting there and they're talking about oh you know i gotta work tomorrow and i didn't get the raise i thought i was gonna get and they're whining and they're sniveling you know and and, uh, and then you walk out in the parking lot and here's the latest pickup with uh you know two thousand dollars worth of tires on it and fancy rims and jacked up and it's got a thirty thousand dollar ski boat behind it i mean you know and all that stuff and i'm thinking you know we've got the best job in the world uh the pay is good i mean where else can you go <clears throat> and I don't say this often, but I think to a degree it's true, where else can you go and have the job that we have with the benefits we have with a high school education? Now, I'm not exactly. saying that, that a high school education uh, is, is, uh, is, is, uh, is, um, is, is a benefit. And it, it is, but, of course, a college education is better. But it's just that, you know, um, I had a, an Associates of Arts degree, and... Uh, you know, in Los Angeles, I could have gone all the way up to the position of deputy chief. You know, the number two or three guy in the department, basically, with a uh, with an associate's of arts degree. Nowhere else can you do that. Nowhere else can you can you go to work and have every day uh, different than the day before and have an opportunity. And I'm going to use one of Brunacini's um, uh, statements: customer service to serve your neighbor, to serve the people that are paying your salary. And, um, you know, that's one of the, the prime differences, I think, between a police and a fire. Well, actually, you know, uh, police and fire have one thing in common. They What's both that? always want to be a fireman. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you, you know, know, police, when they get there, they're the bad guys. Fire, when they get there, they're the good guys. Exactly. And I've said it before because I, I had that opportunity to do that early in my career. It's We've got the same mission, just two different avenues to get there. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a... A semi coming uh, southbound on I-35 through town yesterday and lost a, a tire that killed a, a state worker on the side of the road. Just hit him, and, and you know it's one of those things that you know I wasn't there in violation or not. But you know if, if a truck tactical officer or, or you know an enforcement officer had maybe stopped them before when we just take their hand out tickets, you know that that 52 year old um, you know gentleman is going home to his family. You know, it's it's that kind of stuff. But even I mean, back to you said about the passion and the guys back in the front. Even on our worst day, it's still the best job in the world. Still it's, the best job in the world is exactly right. You know, and so what do I what do I say to a firefighter today? Uh, to me, number one is integrity. That you know, even if you get laid off, uh, and and the uh, and the times that we're going through right now, they're cyclical. They'll come back. Um, and so, if if a firefighter uh, you know, it gets happens to be laid off today. There's there's a good probability uh, he'll get rehired down the road again, um, based on his performance when he was there. And that's why I think never lose sight of the goal and integrity. And you know, even if you were to get laid off from a department, people in departments come and go. Departments always have openings. And so, just if a firefighter was to get laid off from a department, that that's not the end of the world. Uh, it might be for a short period of time, but there's other departments that will have openings, and your department will probably have an opening again. There's a good chance you might get hired because, as I said, the uh, the financial crisis we're going through is cyclical. That doesn't happen all the time. And so well, I think it's to maintain your focus, but most of all is maintain the integrity that you have. Well, and, and, and actually, again, when you're looking at people losing jobs and everything, yeah. You you can either and it's, I, I told someone I met with him recently and I said you can either take this and you can go home and you know let it get to you you know what I'm saying and I've always said oh, before yeah. when you let bad things enter your body and bad feelings you're letting the enemy win yep. you know 
I'm not the one that 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 is wondering where my next paycheck's going to come from. But at the same time, take that energy and turn it into like what you just said. I'm going to, you know what, if they if they can't have me because it's just a bad economy, then I'm going to go somewhere else and I'm going to be the best damn firefighter I can. And you, you use it as a hardening, as a, as a, as a, you know, someday, somewhere, you're going to be sitting with some young firefighter when you're chief of department or a lieutenant or a cat battalion chief going, we've been through these times. Actually, you know, I was actually put off on a job. I was laid off. And mm-hmm. look where I'm at now, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know. Um, you know, I live in Oregon and have for the past, I don't know, 15, 16 years. And, you know, you made a statement a couple minutes ago about professional test taker. And there are hundreds of professional test takers in Oregon that uh, go around all the departments in Oregon and uh, or Idaho, you know, which is a neighboring state, and uh, take tests. And uh, one guy I know started off with a, a very small department here, Talent, uh, which is next to Medford, and uh, he's now engineer on the Medford Fire Department just because he kept that focus, that goal, and... Uh, you know, brought himself up and uh, kept taking the exams, and uh, finally he he got his goal, what he was after. Well, and it's that hang in there, like you said. Um, back to your story of how you got into it, the perseverance, the passion, the yeah. desire, and you know, if, if you if you're given a bad turn, um, then you, you know how you take that energy and refocus and and yep. and go out there. Somebody's going to grab a hold of you, um, and then someday you're going to use it as a as a lesson for that young firefighter. I mean, you've seen so many changes in the fire service since 19, well, since 1963. We talked mm-hmm. about a few already. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what do you see uh, in the way of where the fire service is going? Uh, we, we could throw that, John, into whether it's just our tactics and strategy. Um, we know our apparatus is changing. Personally, I think it's the, the, the engines are getting too big. And I mean, in a bad way, I mean, the hose beds are getting so high that you know we're hurting more people trying to get the hose off the rig than actually fighting the fire sometimes. Um, but w- where do you see the fire service going as a whole? I know it's kind of a general question, but you know, w- with well, everything, it's a, it's a general question, but it, it, I think it also can be a very specific question because um, <clears throat> I look at it from um, there's a lot of perspectives, and I take it most of the time back to fire ground operations <clears throat> because that's where we're hurting people. People basically are the same. I mean, the officers that I worked for back in the <coughs> excuse me, in the 60s and 70s weren't a whole lot different than the officers that we have today. But I think the cards that were dealt today are a whole lot different than the cards that we were dealt in the 60s and the 70s. And if somebody was to say, well, John, what do you mean by that? I mean that uh, a lot of the stuff that I did in the 60s and 70s I took for granted. And when you say fire ground operations, um, when I do a class, I talk about two clocks on the fire ground. There's the, uh, there's the regular fire ground clock that most people are familiar with, and there's the other fire ground clock that when you pull up in front of a building and you stop and you set the air brakes on the apparatus, how long is it going to take you before you make a visible impact on the fire? That's the second fire ground clock. And I think two detrimental things to the fire service <clears throat> that we took advantage of unknowingly back in the 60s and 70s, and one of them is building construction. Now, I know people have heard that phrase you know, lightweight construction, John, and I've heard that for 40 years. I mean, what else do you got? But I think the fire service is turning <clears throat> a corner, and particularly if you start to see more and more and more of the glued trusses today. And, uh, you know, we've gone from conventional construction, and um, which in the 60s and 70s, you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s, I rarely ever worried about building collapse. I rarely ever did because I rarely ever saw it because we're talking about a heavy grade of construction. And so, I mean, we'd get up on a roof and we'd run around, do jumping jacks, and wouldn't give it the time of day. You can't Dimensional lumber, right? We had Con- dimen- conventional dimensional post lumber. And beam. Yeah, the, the, the good heavy stuff. Yeah. And I can remember <clears throat> the last roof that I cut as a truck engineer. It was a bar about 2 o'clock in the morning, downtown L.A., and we pop up on the roof and we're walking around laughing, having a good time take the saw, and I start to cut, and I'm thinking, boy, this saw is really cutting good, and I'm cutting plywood. And I remember opening the hole up and looking down, and there's the firefighters down there. You know, they just put the fire out. If, if anybody's listening to this, Rick, and they're on a truck, you know, trucks cut holes in the roof so they can always look down to see who put the fire out. That's why they do that. <laughs> <laughs> but 
I remember looking at the structural members, and they were wooden I-beams or TGI joists, you know, whatever you want to call them. I had never seen those before, never had. And I remember to this day going, gee, that's interesting, turning around and walking away and never giving another thought until I became an officer on a truck. And I, one day I remember thinking, you know, John, if this is what you're working on now, you better get your act together and figure out when you should and when you should not be up there which I never thought about before, basically speaking. Well, <clears throat> the building industry is always coming up with new and innovative ways to build a building higher, faster, and cheaper. And now we're starting to see glued trusses, whether it's residential or commercial. And if the tests that they've done, some fire departments, not UL approved, and they're saying the glue melts at 250 to 300 degrees, if that's true, and I think it is, you've got you to gotta stop and think about that for a minute that what the building industry has done, is doing, is taking away, I think, a lot of time that we have to go in, whether it's fire attack, whether it's a search or whatever, you know, because the TGI, which is very, very common today, does not give you the time to do an interior attack or to do a search when it's being weakened by fire. And the national average is five to seven minutes. Right. And that's why I say the fire ground clock, but number two is when you pull up in front and you stop, how much time is it going to take you to get off, get your pre-connect, get your stuff on, force the front door, go in, pull the ceiling. You know, Would you give me four minutes to do all that? You just spot the fire four minutes on top well, and, of what you already spotted it before you ever got there. And, John, I mentioned Jay Kuhn. One of the best, two, two great things he said about when we were talking truck operations way back when was, well, when I asked him about the personality trait of what he'd like to see in a truck officer, one of the things he said was, I'd like to have known that they were a good engine officer. Yeah. He goes, and I've never, you know, me being a truckie, I was always like, you know, we're always into the engine truck competition and all that, you know, stuff we do sometimes, silliness. And and he says, no, he goes, you know what, he goes, I, some of the best truck officers I've, I've been around have been those that run an engine company that truly know what it is we need to do for them and, and brings that to it. The other thing he said was we need to slow down. And, and stop and take a look like we used to 30 years ago. We used to take a look at the fire. You mentioned getting off the rig and how quick and, you know, your timing. You know, how how we, we've seen for years, and this is something a lot of people don't want to do, which I think it's an incredible way to, to be able to tell, you know, Chief Mittendorf's new company officer or new firefighter when that new firefighter says, well, Chief, how, how quick should I be able to get that cross layoff, stretch to the front door, and be flowing water? You can't do that without having done minimum company standards within your department, right? right. I mean, you, right. don't you have to have some kind of measurement so you know? I mean, isn't that important? I guess I'm blending the firefighter kind of thing in with the company officer. In order to make good decisions tactically, don't you have to have an idea? You just mentioned how many minutes this stuff fails, but how fast your people can do what they're doing or how much time it takes so you don't put them in it. Isn't that important? Oh, it's a, it, it's a fundamental. One of the things that floored me the first time I saw it is, you know, you teach with, uh, with Salka quite often, and a fellow that I've taught with for probably the past 15 years, Paul Stein. And some what a great will, guy. Well, no, Paul, exactly right. And uh, his forte is leadership, uh, you know, management by objective and, and all that stuff, you know. And, and I remember the first class that he did this, and we were, um, we were doing – I did the fire ground stuff, and he did the leadership stuff. He asked the class, he said, do you have a standard, or how long does it take you to put your SCBA on? How many people here can do it in less than a minute? Very few hands went up. And he said, let me ask that question again. How many people here can put your SCBA on in less than a minute? Very few could. I couldn't believe it. Well, they had, they had no standards. And then, and, and then after that, he did that more and more often. And that just wasn't one time, Rick. That was that. I mean, yeah, some people say, "Oh, yeah, not a problem." You know, forty-five seconds, fifty seconds, no sweat. But it that seemed to be an occurring theme. But now, nah, you know, I just put it on, and when I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go. <clears throat> and then we did a program in Hillsboro, which is. Um, Oh, he's going to kill me because I forgot his name. Hillsboro is just uh, west of Portland, Oregon. Okay. And uh, to this day, I can remember Paul asking the question, how many of you guys have a standard for putting your SCBA on? All the hands went up. What is it? Less than 60 minutes. Excuse me, less than one minute, 60 seconds. 
And then this guy stood up, he says, and most of us can do it in less than 25 seconds. Paul goes, no way. So the old deal, well, you want to bet a little ice cream or cake on that? <laughs> no problem. Well, after the class is over, they want you to come on over to our fire station. Plenty good. The class was over. We cruise over the fire station. And this guy, he says, okay, I'll go first. He puts it on in 23 seconds, and he's ready to go. Couldn't believe it. Well. The other guy says, I can beat that. He puts it on, in he does it in 20 seconds. I mean, these guys were just so smooth and so fast. And to this day, I never forgot that. Here was a department who had standards, minimal standards, but they exceeded them, and they were proud of what they were could, and, of what they could do, and they were willing to show you. John, you're talking about Hillsboro, Oregon, right? Where yes. Our good friend uh, Gary Seidel. Gary is Seidel. Right Thank you. Yeah, very Gary. Good. He, I mean, Gary. As soon as you said, I'm going. Oh, you got to be talking about Gary. And you know what? His department, which I've been around, that doesn't surprise me to see that they've got their act together. Yep. Um, you know, I think uh, I would ask people this question: Have you ever <clears throat> taken a company out, pulled it up in front of, let's just say, a structure on the weekend, or you know, or whatever, and timed? how long it takes your people to get off, and if you're going to lay a line, lay a line or whatever. But just do the basics. Pull your pre-connect off. Get your stuff on. Get your face piece on. Get your bottle on. You're ready to go. How long does that take you? And uh, I think some of the numbers that you'll come up with are going to be surprising, both from a good aspect and an improvement aspect. Well, the, those young firefighters, when they ask you, when you, know, like you say, when, when the chief or the captain or the lieutenant sits down and says, you know what, we, were way too, we took way too long, Mm -hmm. stretch it at initial tack line well, mm -hmm. and that young firefighter says well how, how what are you looking for you know cap what you know tell me what what how much time should it take me to to do that and you go well pretty damn quick you know i mean it's like no 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 what, how you know because right. especially nowadays a lot of it's on you, you can't, tell me what my time frame is they want to know what time uh, mm -hmm. gr great generation great young firefighters men and women coming on the job but they want to know how, how can you tell them if you don't know how long it takes you to, to ladder a roof, get up there and cut a hole, or to, you know, even, you know, drop that supply line or set your ladder truck, all those different things. I think, John, I think years ago, Chicago, if I remember right, used to do, Ray Hoff used to tell me, I think it was the bunk room hitch or something along those lines, where they used to actually make you sit on the side of your bunk and go, go, and they would time you from the time you got dressed, you know, on the rig and wheels up, rolling out the door to see how quick you could turn out of the firehouse, you know, just safely to see how quick that was. I you mean, know, in Los Angeles, <laughs> uh, there was uh, three of us chiefs that conducted the exams for engineer, truck engineer. And uh, one chief uh, was in charge of the drive. Another chief was in charge of an offside spot, and I was in charge of the onside. In other words, onside, you spot the aerial device the same side that you're sitting on. <clears throat> and I forgot the exact number. I'm going to be awful close. But we would come down the street, and he would, we would have a multi-story building, and, you know, we would have the window up there marked. And I would tell the candidate, okay, I want you to spot in front of the building and put the aerial device to that window up there that uh, has the white mark across the bottom of the window. Do you understand? Yes, I do, sir. Okay, when you're ready. When the rig started to move, <clears throat> I started timing him, and when he laid the aerial device into the window and locked it and turned around and told me that the ladder was ready for climbing, they had to do it less than three minutes. And I think three minutes was correct. That's not very long. And some people would say, you can't do it in that amount of time. Well, a little bit of practice, a little bit of pride, you can do it in way less that amount of time. Well, and that's actually, if, if we right now were just sitting here and we said, okay, John, you, you've got your stopwatch going, all right, Let's stop and let's just time and let's have dead air for three minutes. Mm -hmm. that, that you know, <laughs> that's a long time. Three, yeah, three minutes to get from from here to Houston, which is a five-hour drive from Dallas, is a long time. Yeah. three minutes is a long. It's a lot longer than you think. A lot it really than is. You think, but if you don't know what you're doing, it's not enough. <laughs> it's well, not enough time either. Yeah, exa exactly. If you if you don't practice, that goes back to the drilling. Let's uh, and I, actually let's move back to that. Okay. Because just what you said just now r reminded me of what we were talking about a little bit earlier. How do you deal with you, you know, Again, you walk into the you you just went from the busiest firehouse in your battalion the slowest. to the slowest, and the company right. officer says, "Yeah, you know, we haven't had a fire in six months, or some of them tell you a year." And how do you keep the guys motivated? What do you do? What, what do you tell them, chief? You know, Rick, uh, I think I think um, I'm going to talk from perspective that 
you and I are familiar with, we both love training. Yes. If you don't love training, this becomes a lot more difficult. But I think if you love training, I think training is one of the most important elements of being a company, off, a company officer. If people were to ask me, what do you think, uh, what's a, a very, very, very important element of a company officer, I would say consistency. If you're going to be a doofus, be a doofus 24 hours of the day, <laughs> or be a good guy. Don't have them wonder what you're going to be when you walk in that day in the fire station, a bad guy or a good guy. Be the same. <clears throat> but beyond that... <clears throat> I used to tell uh, company officers, you know, we're here for 24 hours. There's a lot of things that are going on. You got fire prevention. You got you got food. You got EMS. And of course, EMS is a lot larger percentage now than it used to be. I said, but if you was to ask me what I think is the most important priority, uh, all things being equal, I would say training, because everything that we do is training is the most important non-emergency function that we do in the fire service. Everything, the way that you back apparatus into the fire station is based on you watching somebody else most likely. The way that you eat at the table is based on you watching your mom and dad, what you learn from them. The way that you operate on the fire ground is the way that you have practiced, and that's why people have heard the phrase, you train the way you fight. Right. That's why you practice <clears throat> for real. You know, And I know some guys that are listening to this program uh, we relate to the fact that the officer comes in in the afternoon and says, hey, let's have a, a search and rescue drill. And geez, Cap, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm watching real stories of the highway patrol. You know, what's the deal? <laughs> oh, let's have a drill. Uh, okay, and they whine, they snivel. You know, do we have to put our full SCBA on? Yeah, I know, Cap, you're not going to have me hook it up and breathe out of it. Yeah, oh, you're so mean, you know. Why do we do that? We do that because if you do it right and it's automatic, then when you go to the fire, you don't have to focus on the basics. They're automatic. And what's killing us on the fire ground? It's not the high-tech stuff. It's the basics. It, it's, it's the it, basics. And exactly. so that's why I think it's easy for an officer, if they want to spend the time, and this is the key phrase, spend the time. Does it take time to come up with an applicable, interesting drill? Yes, it does. And what's one of the most practical, interesting drills you can do that's simple? Take a drive. Hey, you can't do this all the time. But, I mean, take a drive out in your district and just pick out buildings. And, and uh, maybe today you focus on forcible entry. And uh, the next shift you focus on electrical utilities. I mean, the list is endless. Um, and I remember... Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I remember that uh, one day that I thought, you know, uh, we have uh, a, a kind of a, a long system in Los Angeles that if you're, if you're off-duty uh, off sick or if you're injured, you know, what you're supposed to do, who you're supposed to notify, and, uh, you know, all that. And so I made up a plasticized sheet for the guys to take home of, you know, if they're off uh, one day, who they're supposed to notify and the phone numbers or if they're injured and, and, you know, all the responsibilities. It wound up that all the shifts in the house, I could start selling those things uh, because it really hadn't been done before, but it was just, it was something that was user-friendly, but it was practical. And so if a company officer is to tell me, gee, uh, chief, I just don't know what to do next shift for a drill, I go, What? Um, one of the best drills, Rick, I've, and I'll just mention this, one of the best drills that I've, I ever saw a captain do is uh, he took he was up on the truck, and he took all the guys, and he says, okay, he says, let's focus on, um, I'll say forcible entry. He said, I want everybody on the, uh, everybody to go to the rig and get a tool and bring it back and tell me how you'd use it for forcible entry. So they do that. He said, okay, put it down, go back and grab another one. Okay. Put it down, go back. Now, this is the third time around. Go back, grab it, bring it back. See, and he kept doing that. And about the fourth or fifth time, now the tools are starting to get a little, you know, there's not many left on the rig. And I'm thinking, this is one of the best drills I've ever seen. Number one, who's doing the drill? Firefighters are. Right. Number two, where's the equipment located? Number three, how are you going to use it? And he did it until the rig was stripped. 
You could do that for any fire ground operation you wanted to, and who did the drill? They did, not the company office. Well, and you mentioned, John, and as I said before, you reminded me of something that uh, another tenured member of the fire service, Jack McCaslin, you know, mm -hmm. the same amount of time that Eddie Enright used to do. When we were at the University of Illinois, down there in Champaign, we used to go down onto Green Street, which is where all the older buildings are. And they'd split the tactics of strategy group in half, and half would walk down the main street looking at all the fronts of the buildings, the doors, the, everything. And the other half would go to the alley, and you'd go, wait a minute, that, that, first of all, that looks different. I thought I saw one store. I'm looking at three different buildings with one, you know, that whole thing. Just what you said, getting out in your district, and, and you could sit there and look at that building and go, okay, guys, it's locked up. How do we get in there? How much hose do we need? How much do we do this? What tools do you I mean, you're right. It's not. You don't have to be upset before as much as I like NIST and what they do and what they provide. Don't take this wrong, people. But um, you don't have to be a scientist from NIST to do a drill for your guys. You, you just got to, you uh, know. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's interesting that um, to this day I still remember two stories. In, in fact, I put both of them in the new edition of the truck book that's coming out. The first story is... <clears throat> I was sitting in my office one night, and this is during the summer, you know, it's light till 9 o'clock at night, and uh, this is truck 29, and uh, so we'd finished with dinner, and I'm going to say it's 6.30, 7 o'clock, so we still got a couple hours of light left, this guy walks in the office, and he goes, hey, Cap, he says, how about if we take the rig out and just practice putting up the aerial, and I thought to myself, sweet, <laughs> they want, they, in other words, it's the evening, you know, time to relax, cruise, right, and by the way, downtown LA was Fire City, so it's not like... You know, these guys have been sitting around all day. Right. And I, and I thought, you know, how sweet it is. They want to go out, and, and they want to improve their uh, their knowledge, their effectiveness. Second story. <clears throat> when I was chief of training, uh, you know, Monday through Friday, then Saturday, you work around the house. Sunday, we went to church. So our church was about a half hour away, so we drive through a couple towns to get there. So we would drive past this one fire station, I'm going to say 8.30 in the morning, and they had uh, three or four bays. One bay had an engine, one had a truck, one had a chief, one had a rescue ambulance. So that's four bays. <clears throat> so we'd come back about 11, 11.30. Uh, well, let me back up. So at 8.30, here's all four rigs sitting there. We come back about 11.30, here's all four rigs sitting there. This went on for 10 months. I never said anything. After about 10 months, we drive by in the morning, and I look over. There's the four rigs sitting there. Come back in, uh, you know, 11 o'clock. There's the four rigs sitting there. My wife, <clears throat> who's not a firefighter, to this day I can tell you exactly what she said. She looks over and she says, when do you suppose they go out and drill? <laughs> 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 and I thought, <clears throat> how sweet it is. And she, well, and she was, you know, she was exactly right. And, you know, one of the best drilling training simulators that every officer has is their district. It doesn't get any better than that. Why? Because that's your fire ground office. That's where you go. And it's right there. You don't have to have software. No. You don't have to have permission to drive your streets. You don't nope. have to have. You own it. It's yours. If it's under construction, you need to get out and look at it before they button it up. We've talked about yeah. that before. This is your chance. And you know, if you got bad weather, oh, I can't go outside. It's snowing. It's cold. I got a digital camera. <clears throat> I can take pictures. I can come in. <clears throat> and we used to do this. Uh, I put stuff on the table. Uh, back when I was a truck officer, and I noticed that when I did that, and I'd say, okay, you're going to be the captain, you're going to be the engineer, you're going to be the firefighter, what would you guys do? We'd spend hours talking. They loved it. Absolutely loved it. <laughs> you well, know, uh, another quick story, Rick. Yeah. I remember when I was downtown, <clears throat> you know, administrative duty, that I could walk into the, uh, the Bureau of Fire Suppression office and pull out the drawers, the requests for transfers, and, you know, I knew who the good officers were, and I knew who the couch potatoes were. <clears throat> a couple of our smoking fire stations at that time was Fire Station 33, Fire Station 9, Fire Station 14. I mean, Fire City, uh, the officers uh, were stern, but they were, um, they, you know, I'm going to say legends. I mean, they drilled a lot. One guy's name was Willahan. He, he was known as Drillahan. <laughs> and you would pull out the requests for transfers to his station, and I don't think the drawer was big enough to handle the, the request for transfers. But, why? but don't you think that firefighters want to train most of them? I mean, that you they bet really they want do. It? And why? Why were? Why were those drawers filled with requests? Because the guys wanted to go to that station and work for that guy and learn the job. 
learn the job. And then I could pull out uh, a drawer for a couch potato station, virtually nothing, nothing. And, and so there's a, there's a huge difference. I also noticed when I became a chief officer that we would do drills, <clears throat> you know, you'd have five or six fire stations standing there that the, in, in some cases the old timers would kind of gravitate towards the back and all the young guys would be in the front because the old guys didn't want to get called on and uh, get asked a question and couldn't answer it. And the young guys would go, I thought you knew all that stuff. <laughs> well, and John, let me ask you this. Are you, are you ever too old or too experienced to train? I know that sounds kind of silly, but I, I know where you're going to go with this. Are you ever too experienced or too old to train? No, absolutely not, because there's always new developments. There's always something happening. Uh, you know, I mentioned uh, glued trusses, uh, you know, thermal imaging cameras. Uh, oh, we got thermal imaging cameras. I can just walk in and find out where the fire is. Oh, really? Do you have a spare battery in your pocket? What happens when that thing goes out? Right. Uh, oh, I've got the best protective equipment. Yes, you do. Do you think when you walk into a structure day that you think that you're overprotected? Yeah. Well, then how do you monitor the environment around you when you're inside the structure? So the firefighter that's been on for 30 years, are the conditions today the same as they were 30 years ago? Absolutely not. So as technology increases, as our fire ground office changes, I think that on its own is enough reason to be out making sure that you're current with progress. Well, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this at you, and, and just for, for our listeners, we've been, we've been visiting with Chief John Mittendorf. Uh, uh, for those of you that, that, that may not have caught the very beginning, Chief Mittendorf spent over 30 years with Los Angeles. He's well over 45 years in the fire service. If you had him for a class, you know why he, he's with us today, visiting with us on this show today, because just what you've heard already is why. You know, training... Um, the leadership, you talked about consistency, knowing when you walk in that you've got, all right, which lieutenant am I going to see today, Lieutenant Jones that we know or the other Lieutenant Jones? You said that perfectly right. before. Right. You know, you, 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 you walk into your firehouse, and you're walking out after having coffee, you're making rounds <clears throat> as, a, let's say, battalion chief, um, and you see that young kid that's just kind of nervous sitting there, you know, but you know he's brand in a firehouse. You went over and shook his or her hand or whatever. Um, you, you're on your way out. What advice do you give to that rookie firefighter? They got their whole career ahead of them. I know you talked about integrity before, John. Um, you know that and, and staying with your integrity as, as, a, as a foundation, as a base. But you're on your way out, and you just see him, and you're like, you know, I want to give him something that's him or her that's going to, you know, you know what I'm saying? That little. Kid. You bet. What do you What do you say to that rookie chief? I'm going to approach this from a little different angle. Um, what would I tell the rookie? I would tell him, you know, you you have the best, and we've talked about this before, Rick, you have the best job in the world. Take advantage of it. Uh, keep your focus. Keep your integrity so that when they say your name is Rick Lasky, when your name is whatever it is, they go, there is somebody that I can count on who has a focus and who has integrity. You're not going to learn everything your first year or two. You can learn your entire career. And the other thing that, the, that I've always had um, kind of under the saddle a little bit is I've always looked at uh, ranks in the fire department from two perspectives. There's the person who wants to promote as fast as they can, and there's the person who wants to gain the experience they think is necessary, and when the day is right, they feel now is the time to promote. And I'm in the camp of the, of the uh, former... Uh, of the last one and not the first one. There's nothing wrong with promoting as fast as you can, but I think it's wiser for that young firefighter to take advantage of the knowledge that's around them. And if, they're, if, if they see fire stations or officers in the department that they feel that they can learn from to the best of their ability, see if you can take advantage of that, if you can work for that person. Um, Go, in the, essence, uh, go shopping for that mentor, right? Exactly young, right. Go. A, fire, a firefighter has, um, not until later in your career do you realize how fortunate you were to work for an officer who took the time to pass their knowledge on to you. It always broke my heart when some of the legends of the Los Angeles Fire Department retired because I thought, there goes, and you know this is true of any department, Rick, there goes a wealth of knowledge that's probably going to be lost. 
and uh, I can I can remember back when I was a truck officer, if I had asked somebody, can you name me 10 good truck officers, they could rattle off 20. If I was asked that question today, uh, the answers would be a lot slower. Wow. And, 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 I, and, it, and it's just because uh, we have less fires today, you know, than yesterday. But anyway, back to your question, um, is to keep your focus, is to get the knowledge, and if you want to promote, fine, but don't promote just because it's the thing to do. Promote because you feel that you have something to offer your department. And if that's true, one of the advantages of promoting is you have a wider span of control, which allows you to impact your department more positively uh, for that department. Well, let's let's take it the next step. <clears throat> you, you shook that firefighter's hand with that incredible advice you just gave him or her. You make your round to Station 42 next, <clears throat> and as you're walking out, you're leaving that brand new um, lieutenant or captain, first grade company officer. However, your department works if it's lieutenant, first, or captain. <clears throat> Excuse me. Same thing. You, you, you turn around, you go back, and you want to say something to that, that brand new company officer. What would that be? I would tell that person to treat his people the way that he would want to be treated. And that goes back to uh, be consistent. Whatever you are, be the same all the time. And take advantage of the knowledge. Of your people. To me, the perfect officer is somebody who recognizes the talents of the people that work for him, and there's a lot of them, there's a lot of them, and utilizes those talents and feels that if he was to step out of his position tomorrow, the people that work for him could step right in and keep the organization going. All right. Lastly here, <clears throat> um, we've talked about the changes in the fire service, and I'm going to reach out here for something. Uh, since 1963. Let, let me stop just okay, for a second ahead, ahead, and, and take you back on that question, take you off on a tangent. And, and okay. I think this is something else that the chief officers don't do enough of. <clears throat> and I would ask a chief officer, and let, let's just say you've got uh, some officers, some captains, lieutenants, whatever, working for you. Do they know what you want? And I know that's a simple question, but in a lot of cases the answer is no, they don't. Because uh, <clears throat> when you pull up to a fire, that the way that the size-ups, the, the radio traffic, the way that the apparatus is parked, everything that's happening is an outgrowth of either they know what you want or you've never told them what you want. Right. And as an example, when I would uh, take over a new battalion, um, I'd, you know, give it a month or two, and then I would get the captains together. We'd have a captain's meeting. I'd say, you know, whether it's fire ground operations, uh, whether it's discipline, uh, we had perform we had evaluate annual evaluations on on the job you know as an example i would say don't ever forward me an evaluation on somebody that is straight satisfactory because i know what you did 5 minutes before that was due you sat down and just checked the uh, average boxes and signed it and asked the guy to sign it and he knows what you did too you never gave that guy credit for what he's done and nobody is perfect everybody has their strengths and their weaknesses but there's a lot of officers that don't take the time to accurately rate their people when these guys have worked for these officers for a year or two, whatever. Maybe they've given their best, maybe they haven't. So at any rate, let your people know what you want from them. They can't give it to you if they don't know what it is. And so many people, John, you're right, they, they don't pay the attention that those performance evaluations are due. If you realize just, how, you know, I can't believe it's that time of year again, you know what? It's an incredible tool that allows your your people to know where they're going, how they're progressing. Exactly. A and we just sometimes look at it as just one of those other pain in the rear end things, you know, that we don't want to do. And you're you're right on. You're do right we have, on. Uh, do we have an extra minute? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, something just crossed my mind. This is something I talk about in classes uh, once in a while. Uh, it just came to my mind because we were talking about performance evaluations. For the people that are listening. <clears throat> I think probably one of the hardest things to do in the fire service is to tackle somebody who is abusing sick time. Yeah. And as soon as I say that, people go, oh, yeah, <laughs> cool. <laughs> and, you know, if you're a company officer <clears throat> and you've got people, and this is common, and you've got people that are abusing sick time, you know, nobody is sick every month. Um, how do you handle that? Because if you don't, the people that work in the fire station are watching you to see what you do about it. If you don't do anything, they go, well, okay, you know, status quo. <clears throat> Something I came across one time, and I'm just going to throw this out. 
It is an absolute beauty. I've used it probably uh, six or seven times. It's a 100% effective. <coughs> is you take a, you make a medical calendar. A medical calendar is if you look at any calendar, the last page will have all the months. You know, January, February, March, and so on. And in the January box, you'll have one through 30, and then you know February one through 29, whatever. <coughs> and then what you do is you uh, you go through, let's say for the past year, whatever, and you start crossing out the dates this person was sick nine times out of ten a pattern will jump right off that at you right and then what you do is you call the person in you know if it's appropriate and the key word to use is inordinate first time i ever tried this i uh, laid this on the guy and he looks at me and he says so what are you a medical doctor i thought "Ooh, <laughs> got me <laughs> so what you do is you call the person in you go you know I was just uh, checking the records, and it appears as though you're taking an inordinate amount of time off duty. And I'd slide this baby across the uh, the table, and here's all the days marked off. And I'd say, um, is there a problem? Is there something I can help you with? <clears throat> that alone right there, as soon as somebody knows that you're tracking them, will cure it the majority of the time. If it doesn't cure it, you've already started the paperwork trail on them. <clears throat> And I, I, as I said, Rick, it's uh, virtually 100% effective. The last guy that I used that on uh, was an engineer, <coughs> and uh, he actually started to break down because when I when I did the calendar on him, he was gone on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And, you know, some guys are gone when you have the big drill on your department. Right. Somehow they're always sick. Maybe yeah, well, it's that STBA works. drill time. You got it. So yeah. anyway, so he actually started to break down. He said, you know, he said my wife left me. And he said, I've got to take my daughter to, it was a dance class or something, or whatever it was, you know. And I said, you know, I said, we can fix that. I said, you know, but I'm just disappointed that you didn't give me the chance to help you with it. End of problem. End of problem. Well, so anyway, I just, if you're not I just here, throw you're that not out that somebody speak, might be able to use that. Well, as, we, as, we're, as we're looking to close things out uh, here, Chief, with, with the show today, um, I wanted to just ask you real quickly, you, you know, 1961, 1963, the whole process started for you. You've been doing this a long time. Mm -hmm. um, if you could pick, and it's going to be hard, buddy. <laughs> um, <laughs> what a thing to do at the end of the show. But, but if you could pick one thing that you say would have the, the most dramatic impact that you have seen in the fire service since starting, over, over, your, over your tenure, over you know, the 40-plus years, what would, if you could lay your finger on one thing, what would it be, Chief? Well, I'm going to jump off the page on you, Rick, because um, <clears throat> I put this challenge in the new edition of the truck book that's coming out. In fact, uh, Fire Engineering is going to carry this article. I think Diane said it's going to be November. That I'm, I, uh, <clears throat> I want to challenge the fire service to rethink fire ground priorities. And, and I say that from the perspective of RECIO, that... When I travel around, when you travel around, if you ask firefighters what is the most important fire ground priority, most of the time you'll get firefighter safety. And, and I think few people will argue with that. Right. But a lot of times you'll get search is the most important fire ground priority. <clears throat> and I don't think that is correct a lot of the time. I think in, in the question that I'm now starting to ask, has search been overemphasized at the expense of firefighter safety in this country? And I think the answer to that is, an, is a, uh, a resounding yes, it is. And, um, and, and I say that based on one day I was thinking about RECIO, which every firefighter has memorized, and nowhere in RECIO or LUVERS or LUVERS US or any of those fire ground acronyms is firefighter safety ever addressed. It's rescue, 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 rescue. Right. And there's times for a rescue, but are we putting firefighters at a needless risk unless there is a need and a knowledge to do that? And I think the answer is yes. And I oh. think the new construction that we just talked about recently has made that even more important today. But I think in a lot of departments today, to be able to go in and put the fire out and then do a search... Uh, some people would say, well, John, that's wrong. You should go do a search first to make sure nobody's in there. And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, well, um, I don't think so, in a lot of cases. If I put the fire out, you know, and how many times have, 
a lot of departments out there, it's 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 while they're advancing lines, they're finding people. But if you don't, I mean, God, we can go back. I mean, if you don't put the fire out, it, it's going to continue to double in size for every minute, and and it's just going to make matters worse. They called exactly. you, the, you know, John Norman said you, they called us to put the fire out. Put the fire out. Put the fire and, out. That and that uh, dovetail that in with forcible exit. Uh, we always talk about forcible entry. But if it's important to get into the building, it should be as, if not more important, to be able to get out of the building. And I think most firefighter deaths would either not happen or be significantly reduced if it was easier for firefighters to get out of the building, which we don't focus on. We focus on getting in, but we don't put this, the equal focus to getting back out. Again, now back to your whole size up building construction, understand the building, where you're at, all that is just... And you can do that while it's daylight, while there's no smoke, and you're not with an SCBA face piece on. You can see what you've got. Hey, yeah. when, when's the new book coming out? Do you know? Boy, I just sent the whole thing in about two weeks ago, so I'm going to say probably around um, December. Uh, December. Maybe, so maybe definitely by next year. FDIC, hopefully by the first of the year. Uh, yeah, and it's going to be significantly different than the, the, the previous one. Okay. Well, the, the previous one, I know for a fact, is on a lot of – promotional exams. I know there's a lot of colleges yeah. that are using it as a tech, so I'm sure this one's going to be the same way. And, and No, I've had seven or eight years to think about the other one and what I should have said, <laughs> what I should <laughs> well, have said the first time around. I know we can't wait because I know that's one of one of the first books we're going to get when, when, you know, when they, when they, as soon as it comes out. But, um, uh, Hey, contact info, Chief. If if somebody wants to get a hold of you, I know you're you're a busy guy, but if if somebody wants to have Chief John Mittendorf come out and and any of those topics, um, is, is there an email address, website? What? How can they? How can they sure, get a hold of you? Sure. The email would be J underscore. That's that little line down at the bottom. Uh, it's like an underlined thing. Okay. It's J underscore Mittendorf. M I T T E N D O R F at msn dot com. Okay, easy one to remember. Yeah, or I can um, give you a phone number. Uh, it, the underscore is kind of a kind of a bear, but the phone number is uh, five four one area code, and then the number is seven seven nine five seven eight nine. Well, and Chief, I can't I can't thank you enough. I mean, oh, this is one of those, it. buddy. I, I I you know when I start thinking about this, I'm going, man, we could do probably four or five, and I'm uh, you're you're another one of my mentors that I'd love to. Uh, get back on another day and, and 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 get just pick your brain again because there's just so much that I want. Well, I'll be selfish here. I want my guys to listen to and hopefully everyone else uh, to because I, I, you just have so much to offer, Chief. And you know how I feel about you. You're an incredible, you know, fire service leader. But but you truly, you know, I, I think just calling you brother isn't good enough because you truly care about people. That's the one thing I've noticed about you, Chief, ever since I met you. And then. God, when you're hanging with your partner Paul, I mean, it, it, it's just like if if you can't tell how much you care about people, again, you're not you're not paying attention. And I can't thank you enough for your friendship, for your leadership. Um, you, you've done tremendous things for a lot of people in the fire service, and I know you're a very modest guy, and you're going to go, oh, I just enjoy what I do. But you need you need to, you need to hear that once in a while, boss, that you've had an incredible impact on a lot of people's lives, including myself. So, thank well, you thank for you everything very much, you do. Rick. Well, I appreciate you being out here. You've got his contact information. Uh, I know he's internationally sought after. He's 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 across the, the those those big uh, lakes, if you want to call them, uh, the, the the oceans, uh, back and forth, uh, doing programs. Um, but but grab a hold of them, get them out to your place. Um, you will not be disappointed, uh, Chief Mittendorf. Thank you, brother, and I appreciate your time. You thank you, Rick. All righty. Hey, as we always uh, look to end when we talk about uh, everything going on, uh, uh, another great show. Please spread the word. If you've got any uh, suggestions, any ideas, get a hold of me. Get a hold of me at rick at prideandownership.com, prideandownership.com. Uh, that or give me a ring. Uh, uh, my, my phone number is listed at that website as well. Um, and we always end these shows with two very important words, simple words but very important, and that's be safe. Be safe.